Hi, welcome to Nepi Invest. Today I'm going to be talking about Mesoblast. So exciting times for Mesoblast shareholders in the next week because on September 30, we're expecting to hear from the FDA whether one of their treatments will be approved for commercial sale in the United States. I'm fairly bullish it will be. I think it'll be a fairly big upset if it's not approved. So that's in a week's time. So I'm going to be discussing Mesoblast today, what they do, look at some of their financials and why I am bullish, but there is still some trepidations there. So even if you are do have a bullish case for a company, it's good to look at some of the bear cases just in case. So it does set your mind uh, on the right track. So let's get into Mesoblast and what they do. So they're into regenerative medicine. So regenerative medicine is just sort of harnessing the properties that your body has in sort of repairing itself to treat injuries and diseases. So it's a fairly new branch uh, in the medical field. And when I first heard about regenerative medicine, my immediate thoughts went to um, limb and organ growth. And I just thought about, you know, those lizards who can just uh, chop off their tail running away from a predator or what's, whatnot and then just grow a tail back. That's the first things that came to mind, sort of the hip superhero mindset jumped in, and I just thought that would be amazing. But funny enough, that is one of the applications of regenerative medicine. Not, not sure, or well, not where Mesoblast is heading, but it is one of the applications. So first application is organ growth. So that's just the creation of new body parts from your body's own cells and tissues. The second one there is self-repair. That's fairly obvious. So if you have uh, some damage to your heart, liver, or whatnot, it just can repair itself. Your body repairs itself all over. So they're trying to harness in that repairing or regenerative properties your own body has so it can heal your organs. And cellular therapies, this is where mesoblast comes into play. And that's treating diseases like Crohn's, Parkinson's, uh, Alzheimer's, leukemia, um, that sort of thing. So this is where Mesoblast fits into the story of uh, regenerative medicine. So why or what do they have uh, in, in their pipeline? So they've already got some products uh, being sold and they have some products almost uh, in phase three anyway. They're in phase, not almost phase three, they are in phase three. So the main thing there is acute graft versus host disease. So I'm going to call that acute GFHD from now on. They've already got that selling as Temcel in Japan, a commercial agreement there or licensing agreement with JCR. So for those who don't know what acute GVHD is, it's just um, something that affects um, bone marrow or stem cell uh, transplants. It affects about one third to one half of patients within about 10 to 100 days of the transplant, and it's just the inflammation of organs. It's not a very nice disease to get, but uh, and there's no real good treatment. So we've got a treatment here um, that really is gonna benefit uh, these uh, transplant recipients. And we're already seeing significant growth in Japan with their TEM cell. They've also got a Lofacil in Europe at the moment. Uh, not much revenue at that just yet. I didn't, don't think, I know how much revenue they're getting, but it's insignificant, I think they said. And then you got all these um, products that are in phase three and Ryan Saw is the one that's gonna be uh, FDA approved in a week's time. That's again, acute graft versus host disease. I did say, they're gonna say acute GFHD. And they also have uh, that Crohn's disease, um, also back pain, rheumatoid arthritis, that sort of thing. So they've got a lot in the pipeline. They have a lot of IP too. Um, I did see oh, maybe a thousand or something. I don't want to uh, assume there, but um, it was a lot of IP they have potentially coming after this once they make it. And a lot of licensee deals there. You can just see here licensee deals with Tasley, Grunthenthal, and I'll get into some of those details in a minute. Um, so this is the revenue from Temcel royalties in Japan. So you can just see good growth there, $6.6 million. And they need that money because uh, they are burning through a lot of cash. And this is their profit and loss statement. So they could have the commercialization revenue there, 6.6. They have quite a few milestone revenue payments because of uh, their licensing deals. 
that adds up to 32.2, but you can see they're burning through a lot of cash, research and development, because I've got a lot of pipelines going on, a lot of stuff's happening, manufacturing, management and administration. So they burn through a lot of cash each year. So they do capital raisings, but at the moment they have $129 million in cash, I believe. So they have a lot of cash there. And because they have a lot of cash on hand, one of the most important things in my mind is what management do with uh, how they handle capital allocation. So they actually did have a bit of a slide there, what they're going to do with the cash on hand. And the first thing that comes to mind, not mine, but first thing they're going to really focus on is the commercial launch of Ryan Sill, um, once it's approved in a week's time. So they should rapidly go to commercialization of that. And I think that's when we should start seeing the revenue come in. How quickly it grows, I'm not sure, but uh, you can just see in Japan, $6.6 .6 million with their you know, royalties and um, they won't have to divvy up their royalties. Looks like they'll have a fair bit of cash coming in the door once this gets approved. So very exciting um, come in a week's time. I won't get into the others there. I'll just move on. And I just mentioned the major milestones in the next 12 months. The major one is a week's time with the approval of Ryan Sill, but they've got a lot going on here. That's the main thing about this. They have a lot going on, a lot of catalysts, a lot in the pipeline. So even if this doesn't get approved, they've still got a lot going on. Hopefully it will, and I'm fairly sure it will. Just getting some licensing agreements. They have a lot of money coming through potentially with the Grunf Grunenthal agreement. They've already been uh, paid $15 million and, and another 2.5, but they have a possibly $132 million in payments if certain milestones are satisfied. And that's on not to mention uh, further milestone payments uh, based off uh, regulatory and product sales milestones as well as tier double digit royalties on product sales. So potentially a lot of money coming in with that arrangement or agreement. Their uh, Lofasil agreement, they've already got, uh, they're entitled to 10 million or 10 million euros more and they're gonna get single digit royalties. So not as much as uh, the Grunthor one. They're already receiving some uh, sales or royalties there, but it's uh, not significant, they did say. And the Tesla agreement there, fair bit of money there. So this is the one that's, um, for China, uh, they've already received $20 million and they're entitled to $25 million more. So a lot of money potentially coming in there. So before I get to why I am a holder, I'll just tell you some trepidations. Um, if you do follow some of my videos, one of the things I don't like to see is popularity on Hot Cuppa. It, uh, I, it's a hype stock, so today I just took a grab screen grab of the most discussed uh, companies on Hot Copper and Mesoblast was leading, usually Brain Chip usually leads, uh, Novanix was leading yesterday. But I think it's uh, just excitement about what's going to happen in a week. That's why there's so much uh, talk and discussion about Mesoblast. I'm fairly excited too. I haven't joined in the conversation, but um, maybe I should, but I, I'm not really interested in joining in the conversations. I just uh, go to Hot Copper to do a bit of research to look at what's uh, popular and what's not. Lack of revenue, it's more of a, the burning of cash, but I believe uh, that's going to be that's going to be fixed once we get uh, this uh, approval. We're going to see commercialization of Rhinesaw, and that's going to bring in a lot of cash as we move forward the next few years. And FDA, FDA unapproval. So of course you've got to take that into consideration. It's not a certain it's going to be approved, even though I'm saying it'll be a fairly big upset. Upsets happen, and we've got to take that into consideration. And you can see just what happened in August, right at the bottom there, I've got uh, some price movements in, Aug in August based off um, uh, what happened. So we saw, I'll just discuss in the next slide what happened, but we saw the price drop 31% one day and then rise 40% a few days later. So why did that happen? So on August 11, the ODAC, the on Oncological Oncologic Drugs Advisory Committee, which were looking at uh, Rheinsel and, you know, whether it, going to be approved or not there were the document was released and there were some questions they were asking a mesoblast and those questions were suggesting to some people that they were not willing to approve iron so excuse me that they were not uh, willing to approve Ryan Saw, and that's why we saw a 31% drop in price. 
three days three days later, they released their report and they voted overwhelmingly in favour. I believe it was nine to one, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that uh, you know they're willing to you know support what they had, the information that uh, Mesoblast had. So that's why there's a lot of uh, I would say a lot of uh, I suppose a lot of shareholders very nervous, excited, that sort of thing. They would have been going through a lot of mixed emotions during those uh, that week or so. Um, I try to keep control of my emotions, not let that affect me, because I do have Mesoblast in my long-term portfolio, which means short-term fluctuations in price won't bother me. It doesn't bother me because I'm looking at 5, 10, 20 years down the track. My hope with Mesoblast and any company in that, they're all not going to they're all not going to succeed in my long-term portfolio, but my hope is one of them might turn into like a CSL. Uh, 20, 30 years down the track. And Mesoblast is definitely uh, a potential there. Um, so there's that. So why do I hold? So initially I did trade a little bit. So short-term trade Mesoblast, I found it was a good company to trade, especially when it went down to low dollars. Um, but recently I decided to make it a long-term trade just because I think uh, the potential for Mesoblast is quite enormous moving forward. I'm pretty sure they're going to get FDA approved again. You shouldn't assume stuff. You don't want to make an ass of you and me. So let's not assume that. We'll just, I need certainty. Um, and one thing I should add here is my holding in Mesoblast isn't my full holding I want. So I do have a tranche, so a small tranche. And then once they get FDA approval, I might buy another one. Once I see the revenue coming in the door, that's when I'll buy another one. So I don't buy, go all in at once. I need sort of catalysts. I need sort of inflection points to buy further. I believe there's going to be significant revenue going forward. I think we can see that with Temcel, just the, the royalties revenue coming in from Japan, $6.6 .6 million is a fair much, a fair bit. Uh, many catalysts, a lot in the pipeline. So moving forward, very exciting. Um, they have... You know, if something doesn't, it's not like a, it's not one of those, um, what do you say? It's not one of those uh, binary situations where it's either going to be yes or no. Um, if they do get approved, it's going to set them apart. If they don't get approved, that's it for them. If they don't get approved, they still have other things in the pipeline. So it's not one of those binary situations where uh, this is all they have. And the last one there is uh, Julie Lee. So those who uh, know some invest or those who know some of these, um, what do you call it, experts, um, professional experts, I don't know what to call Julie Lee, but she's the uh, CIO of Berman Invest. So I do follow her quite a bit. And she, I believe Berman Invest is the, their largest holding is Mesoblast. And I'm a big fan of Julie Lee. I like her uh, investing philosophies. I followed her for a long time on Your Money. Was it Your Money, Your Call? I forget where I started following her. Um, so I really like her. And because uh, Berman Invest, I'm pretty sure she has a pretty large say in what they invest in. Because she's a large investor in Berman Invest, with uh, in Mesoblast, um, that's good enough for me. So go Julie Lee, go Mesoblast. And... Last of all is just the chart. This goes is a weekly chart going back uh, 12 years or so. You can just see there a lot of hype around Mesoblast uh, in 2010 and 11. Went up all the way up to $10. And this shows you sometimes hype is a bad thing because a lot of hype and really Mesoblast wasn't quite ready for um, sort of monetization of what they were doing at that point. So a lot of hype. We saw the share price go away from $10 all the way to a dollar. We've seen it hit a dollar a few times. So a dollar would have been a really good price to buy. And that's why I was trading this. It hit a dollar, rebound, hit a dollar, rebound. And then in late 2019 is when I bought. It was a great time to buy. Just under $2 I bought. Um, COVID-19, I... Could have sold, but it's in my long-term portfolio. I'm not willing to sell anything out of that, and we're seeing good rises since. So it's looking quite bullish on the chart, uh, the weekly charts, the long-term chart. So uh, it's looking fairly, fairly excited, but um, yeah, that's it. So that's it for Muzzle Blast today. If you have any questions, leave it in the comments. I'll try to 
answer any questions you have. And it's 6.30 here, so I have to go. Um, but so I'm not a professional advisor, so you know, don't uh, just uh, take anything I say and use that to make your decisions. Make your own decisions. That's how you grow as an investor. That's how you learn. And you can use this as sort of a, you know, as a sort of as a guide, maybe something, I don't know. But anyway, um, I'm not a professional advisor. So if you do need advice about anything you're going to do, uh, seek out a professional. And um, that's it for today. So have a good day and I'll talk to you later. Bye.